Hello and welcome to the political history of the United States. Episode 3.33, The Battle of Fort Corralin. Welcome back. Last time, we spent our episode discussing the rise of William Pitt. Now firmly in control of the war effort, Pitt was quick to remove the extremely unpopular Lord Loudon from power. The colonists were thrilled to have Loudon gone, and they were pretty happy with the subsidies that Pitt was suddenly pumping into the colonies. The colonies would, in an incredibly short amount of time, raise a huge army of provincials to pair with a large army of British regulars. Quickly, the British forces in North America were really not that much smaller than the overall population of French Canada. If the theme last week was the war effort getting something of a reboot, this week we are going to clearly see that tide turn. The British are going to march to a quick and easy victory. Right? Well, no, not just yet. As we will see today, despite the changes, there are going to still be some bumps in the road. What William Pitt had in mind for 1758 was a multi-part plan. The first part of that plan was a large British force, under the command of James Abercrombie, who would move first on Fort Corralin, then to Crown Point, and then finally securing everything from Lake Champlain, along the Richelieu River, and out into the St. Lawrence. Now, conveniently for Pitt, Loudon also had been wanting to do this exact same thing, and was already well underway in planning for just such an attack, so the change in leadership was really less of a hindrance than one might think. It is also worth noting that this plan was really not that much of a deviation from what the original plan had been. Recall that way back in 1755, William Johnson's goal had not been to get tied up along the banks of Lake George. Rather, his target had always been to take Crown Point. We had talked about this back in episode 3.28. Possibly to the annoyance of William Johnson, who had really seemed less than excited to move on Crown Point back at that time, he ended up getting hemmed in along the southern part of Lake George. If you'll further recall, after being attacked, Johnson would secure his men at William Henry, while the French would establish Fort Crayolin as a check on the British. And that is where everything has stood since 1755, with, of course, the skirmishes and the battles that we talked about back at Fort William Henry. The second part of Pitt's plan for 1758 was an attack on Lewisburg. This part of the expedition was to be led by Geoffrey Amherst. Born in 1717 to a lawyer, Amherst was 18 when he joined the British infantry. He saw his first real action during the War of Austrian Succession, and was a lieutenant colonel by the end of 1745. Amherst would become an aide-de-camp of the Duke of Cumberland, and would spend the first part of the war over in Hanover. We, of course, know how that goes and what would become of the Duke of Cumberland. Amherst would then head over to North America, which is where he joins our story. For those of you who know a bit more about the reputation of Amherst, you know that his place in history has a pretty huge black cloud hanging over it from his views of Indian relations. We are going to talk about this more next season. However, I wanted to at least acknowledge it right now, as it is going to be a lasting part of his ultimate legacy. The last part of the grand strategy that Pitt had planned was that with Lewisburg to the north defeated and Abercrombie taking care of everything to the south, the British would essentially be in control over the St. Lawrence River. With the St. Lawrence firmly under British control, Amherst and Abercrombie would link up and join their armies for the main thrust of the campaign against Quebec and Montreal. So clearly we have a whole lot of moving parts here. However, without question, Pitt's plan for the North American War were nothing else if not ambitious. For this week, we are going to set Amherst and his campaign aside. This is going to be our topic for the next episode. So for the rest of today, we are going to place all of our focus on Abercrombie and his plans. Before moving on, I do want to mention that there is one more part of Pitt's plan for 1758. However, for today, as well as our next episode, I am focusing solely on the events in the North. However, do be aware that there is also going to be action in the South, 
as once again, British eyes are going to turn back towards Fort Duquesne. You know, the catalyst for pretty much everything that has been happening so far. We are going to get there in two episodes' time, so just know I have not forgotten about them. They are just going to have to hang out on the back burner for a little while longer. Before we can move to the attempts to take Crown Point and secure everything out to the St. Lawrence, we first need to start at that very first step, capture Fort Corralin. Following the defeat of Fort William Henry the year before, Montcalm decided that he was not going to hold the fort. While the advantages of controlling William Henry were obvious, it would have given the French complete control over the southern portion of Lake George, Montcalm did not feel that holding it was possible. Much as at Oswego, Montcalm felt that his supply lines were too tenuous to maintain and that holding the fort would risk overextending his army. Beyond that, Fort Edward was not that far down the road and would have kept the now-captured fort in a constant state of fear as it would have been an ample place to stage an attack to recapture William Henry. Therefore, pretty quickly after the capture of the fort, the French withdrew back to Fort Corralin on the shores of Lake Champlain. As I said a moment ago, the realization that Fort Corralin needed to be captured was not really a stunning revelation to anybody. It isn't as though the British had not been interested in moving on Crown Point for years now, and Fort Corralin was there standing in their way. For Loudon personally, one has to imagine that he was eager to score a decisive victory over the French following the loss at Fort William Henry the previous summer. The fact that preparations had already begun for an attack, an attack that William Pitt still wanted despite firing Loudon, meant that we will not be seeing much in the way of significant delays. The British, therefore, had been busy building the boats necessary to ferry some 20,000 troops up Lake George for an offensive against Fort Corralin. Setting up in the ruins of Fort William Henry in June 1758, Abercrombie had a sizable force at his disposal. With 6,300 regulars, supported by another 6,000 provincials, he held a clear manpower advantage. Now, although there were not significant delays, That is not to say that everything went smoothly. Abercrombie would have much preferred to leave earlier. However, that aside, this really was not the end of the world, and we are talking about delays of weeks rather than months or even years. For the French, there was little secret about anything. Montcalm knew the British were preparing something big. The evidence was literally everywhere. Likewise, both Corralin and Louisbourg were, based on recent history, pretty predictable targets for the British to want to take. Though, that being said, Montcalm had little idea of which was going to be given priority or the specific plans of the attack. Beyond just manpower, the British army assembling itself on the shores of Lake George was a well-armed, well-provisioned fighting force. The plan was to use boats to move up the lake towards Corralin and they certainly brought along the boats to do exactly that. Throughout June, men and equipment continued to amass, and by the time that they were ready to launch, Abercrombie had over 16,000 men under his command. Among those preparing for this massive undertaking was the popular Brigadier General, George Augustus Howe. Howe was extremely popular with the men under his command, and had originally been William Pitt's choice to lead the war effort. However, even the now-powerful William Pitt was stymied here by the far more connected Abercrombie. If you are wondering if George Howe is related to either Admiral Richard Howe or Sir William Howe, both of whom are going to become critical military leaders for the British during the American Revolution, the answer is yes. George Howe was their brother. Throughout June, it was Howe who was busy with making sure that the men were ready for the battle to come, while Abercrombie busied himself with the logistics of moving that many men into position. Among house scouts was a Massachusetts farmer named Israel Putnam. I'm not going to spend much time with Putnam today. However, I want to make a few quick notes about him and give him a kind of minor introduction. Putnam was born in Danvers, Massachusetts in 1718 to Puritan parents. Now, if early 18th century Danvers and the name Putnam have raised your eyebrows, the answer is yes, 
Israel Putnam is one of those Putnams. And Putnam Jr., of which trial fame, was his first cousin. Though they never actually met each other, with Ed Putnam Jr. dying two years before the birth of Israel. The reason that I wanted to introduce Israel Putnam this week is more than anything to let you know that he is getting ready to move on Fort Corellin right now in 1758. We are going to see him again in the future, as he is going to be one of the most pivotal commanders of the Americans during the Battle of Bunker Hill, and would be amongst the leadership under Washington during the Revolution. However, for right now, that fame is still over a decade and a half in his future. At the moment, he is getting ready to head north across Lake George. By the end of June, Abercrombie was in command of what was unquestionably the largest army in the history of British North America. Hundreds of boats arrayed in four columns planned to take the men north across Lake George to the small outcropping of land called Ticonderoga. The French were in a desperate state. They were facing an enormous army that massively outnumbered them. The French had around 3,600 men in the fort, meaning that they were outnumbered by a margin of over 4 to 1. One also has to imagine that thoughts of what went down the previous summer at Fort William Henry were probably never too far from their minds. Not only did they have a huge army bearing down on them, they had a huge army bearing down on them, feeling angry and humiliated from the loss of the previous year. Overall, if you were the French in Fort Corellin in early July 1758, you were probably preparing to have a pretty bad time. Montcalm knew that the situation was dire, and much like Monroe the year before, he was looking at what likely amounted to a lost cause even before the fighting had started. The plan, therefore, for Montcalm was not some brave defense, where he planned to hold off wave after wave of the British army. Rather, he hoped to stall the British long enough that he cost Abercrombie valuable time. The British had a lot of objectives that they needed to hit, and Montcalm certainly knew that at least Crown Point was on that list. If he could stall the British enough, hopefully he could limit the damage before the winter brought him much-needed time to regroup. Corellin was probably lost. However, if he could hold the British up and escape with only minimal casualties, he could go ahead and mark that one down as a positive. With that, the French were busy desperately digging defensive lines to protect the fort. The French spent most of their time cutting down trees to act as cover, as well as taking branches from said trees and sharpening them into sharp points, creating a defensive abatisse. This abatisse was between 40 and 50 yards deep, with the hope being that it would slow the British down as they got stuck trying to avoid impaling themselves on all the sharp sticks. Meanwhile, the French, from their positions behind the felled trees, would shoot the men stuck in the abatisse. With these defenses primarily consisting of sandbags and tree trunks, everybody knew that eventually they would be blasted to bits under cannon fire. However, they would be enough to stop musket balls, which at least is something. The British landed, completely unopposed, on July 6, while the French continued to desperately attempt to build their defensive lines. Part of the problem for the French is that Fort Corellin was not exactly in the most defensible position. Among the biggest problems for the French is that Fort Corellin had a hill right to the west of it. This would later become known as Mount Defiance, if you're looking at a map. Corellin, likewise, had a smaller hill just to the north. Either position would allow the British to fire into the interior of the fort. With a river running between Mount Defiance and Fort Corellin, Montcalm chose the hill to the north as his base of defense, with his troops arrayed down towards the river. The setup would essentially block the only direct land advance on the fort. The initial plan for the British was not to take the most direct route to the fort, as Abercrombie wanted to avoid having to make a double river crossing, which the direct route would have included. Instead, he attempted to have his men march in a long and winding path through the woods, that would have meant that the British attack would have come towards the western side of the fort, whereas the most direct approach would have seen the British attacking from the southwest, as they would need to cross the Lachute River. Abercrombie formed his men into four columns, and began the march through the woods. All was going well, and the British were progressing with relative ease, 
right up to the moment when the column being led by the popular Brigadier General Howe crashed headlong into a detachment of a couple hundred French who had been making their way back towards the fort. A firefight ensued as everybody scrambled into position. In the fight, Howe, the most popular and senior officer for the British, was killed. Per reports, Howe died in the arms of Israel Putnam. Now, on paper, the British actually won this skirmish, as the French were forced to retreat. However, with the death of Howe, it was a Pyrrhic victory at best. With the British approach now no longer a secret to anybody, Abercrombie had little choice but to withdraw back towards the landing site. Just to add some extra icing to the cake of what had been an extremely inauspicious start to the attack, the British withdrawal was sloppy, leading to several instances of reported friendly fire. Despite technically winning the skirmish, by the time that the British had returned to the landing site on the evening of July 6, they had accomplished nothing meaningful and had lost their most senior officer. Okay, so the first day was not great. The British had lost a skilled and popular officer, and really they had zero to show for it. But hey, it's still okay. This is all fine. We're going to be okay. Abercrombie had a chance to regroup, and July 7th was the dawn of a brand new day. The 7th would not be a simple replay of the 6th. Abercrombie had decided that he was going to take a more direct route this time and just deal with the fact that the British were going to have to make a double river crossing. For Abercrombie, the most serious concern at this point was that he was taking too long to take his objective. Abercrombie was already running behind schedule, having left for the invasion late to begin with. Then he had burned an entire day on the 6th because of the accidental encounters with the French. The most serious concern for Abercrombie is that these continued delays were just increasing the risk of French reinforcements arriving and crashing the party. With his new plan in place, Abercrombie is ready to roll out for another, hopefully more successful day. It is here that Abercrombie begins to make some questionable decisions. On the 7th, his army marched north and ended up making camp at an old sawmill, about a mile to the northwest of Mount Defiance, and two miles due east of Karelin. The next morning, William Johnson, who, yes, is still in our story, and a group of Indians and a junior engineering officer made their way to the top of Mount Defiance to get a better look at their situation. This got the reconnaissance force in close enough that the French and British were taking some long-range shots at each other. However, the distance and inaccuracy of weapons meant that it was doing little more than rattling each other's nerves. When the reconnaissance team returned, they presented Abercrombie with three plans. The first plan was for a direct frontal assault. Send the infantry crashing through the front doors and just be done with the entire thing. A direct assault, though sounding dangerous, had some merit. Chiefly, the engineering officer making the report said that Montcalm's forces would be susceptible to such an assault. The British outnumbered the French as well. On the morning of the 8th, Montcalm only had some 3,500 to Abercrombie's nearly 16,000 men. Critically, the officer reported that the French defenses were weak enough that artillery would not be necessary to soften up the French first. The second option was going to be sending a force to go around and hit Montcalm on the right flank. Doing this would have put the British in a position between Lake Champlain and Fort Karelin where an assault on the fort itself could be launched. The last option was like the second, but would have been more similar to a full siege of Fort Karelin. It would have involved the British digging in along the entire front, bringing up the artillery, and then blasting away until the French decided that they did not want to play anymore. As we have already discussed, Montcalm was spread thin, and he was indeed especially vulnerable along his flanks. When examining the decisions made by Abercrombie here, there are a couple of major points to consider. First, Abercrombie was becoming increasingly concerned about the French getting a significant number of reinforcements. Time was of the essence, and he was already behind. Abercrombie had decided to leave the artillery back at the landing site in order to move things along faster. 
Had he gone with an option that would have required artillery use, that was going to further slow down the British advance. Abercrombie then makes the baffling decision to blow off any real scouting or serious attempt at meaningful reconnaissance. And yes, I know I just spent the last few minutes talking about Abercrombie literally sending out a reconnaissance mission to the top of Mount Defiance. However, hear me out. Abercrombie himself had never seen Fort Karelin before. When he decided that he needed to get a more complete view of the area, he did not choose a more senior engineering officer to complete the survey, but went with a junior and more critically inexperienced engineering officer. Without question, the two plans that had the British attack the French right flanks were superior. The flank was the weakest part of their defense and it was the most exposed part of the line. However, for Abercrombie, he was desperate to make up some time. Hauling up the artillery was going to be time-consuming. Using said artillery to soften up the French positions was likewise going to take time, both in regards of moving the British howitzers into position and maintaining an artillery barrage. Plus, our junior engineering officer had said that a frontal assault with no artillery support was doable. For Abercrombie, there really was no debate. This seemed to be the fastest way to wrap up the mission at Karelin and move on to the much more important target of Crown Point. When he brought together a war council, the question was not which of the three plans to follow. It was simply about how many columns were going to head out crashing through the French front lines. With the decision made, eight regular battalions quickly formed up and began the assault. With everybody formed up, the march began orderly and professionally. This was about as good as things were going to go for the British. In very short order, the British had discovered the French abatis, those sharpened tree branches that the French had created to slow down the British advance. Right at that same moment, as the British struggled to move forward, the French opened fire and started dropping troops and officers all along the front. Let's just for a moment double back to the French defenses. Earlier in this episode, I had mentioned that the French had spent their efforts in defending their line by dropping trees for cover and creating those abatises to slow up the British. Montcalm, even as he ordered them to be completed, was well aware that all the French defensive measures were going to do was stop small arms fire. Artillery would blast the French defensive works to bits, and really, these efforts were a prime example of just being better than nothing. However, suddenly, these defenses became a whole lot more formidable. Sure, artillery would turn them into a mixture of shrapnel and sawdust, but Abercrombie, in his hurry, decided to forego the use of artillery. The French were only going to need to deal with small arms fire of an infantry assault, which really was about the one thing that the French defensive efforts were actually good enough to stop. The French abatis was doing its job nicely and helped break the British formations, further leaving them unable to mount a meaningful counterattack. Reports from the ground painted a grim story. As men were getting stuck in the tangled, sharp branches, they were being gunned down by the French. The bodies of those killed then became an additional obstacle to get past, forming their own gruesome barricades. Abercrombie was not blind to the fact that things were really not going great. Back at his position of command at the sawmill near the river, he made some attempts to rush some cannons up the river on barges to try to help relieve the now beleaguered infantry. The hope is that the cannons that he had could help soften up the left flank of the French line, the group that had been doing so much damage to the British. Unfortunately, it was not only a matter of being too little too late, but even this attempt to relieve his troops was poorly executed. The barges were easily spotted from the fort, and then the lead two were promptly sunk before making any kind of contributions. The remaining barges realizing that they had zero hope of doing anything other than sinking, turned around and hightailed it out of there. Things were looking a bit like Braddock's loss back in 1755, 
the British troops spent the rest of the day in often unsuccessful attempts to reform their ranks and press forward. However, despite unquestionable courage and discipline, they simply could not break through the French lines. By the time that the sun was setting on July 8th, Abercrombie had become painfully aware that, despite his men's best efforts, it just was not going to happen. For the second time in two days, Abercrombie called for his men to withdraw all the way back to the relative safety of the landing site. The losses were staggering for the British, whose casualties numbered around 2,000, including 1,600 regulars. French casualties for the day were under 400. Unlike the situation on July 6, the day that Howe was killed, there would be no regrouping this time. The British, somewhat inexplicably, did not stop their retreat when they hit the landing site. They just kept going. It was not until they reached the ruins of Fort William Henry that they finally settled back in. This decision to retreat and abandon a large amount of their gear at the landing site was surprising to just about everybody. Montcalm certainly would not have expected that the British were going to completely withdraw. The French had won the day, which, yeah, that is great. But the battle? Well, the British had just had a really bad day and had lost a significant number of their fighting force. Recall that they had started with some 6,300 regulars. Even the loss of 1,600 of them meant that the British still had 4,600 regulars left to fight. The French, who had begun with 3,600 men and had seen a mixture of losses and reinforcements arrive, still had less than that initial number. At a base level, the British regulars still had the manpower advantage. Furthermore, I'm only talking about the regulars. If you include the provincial troops, whom the British still had 8,600 of waiting in the wings, they still commanded a very significant advantage. This is to say nothing about the fact that the British, despite not using it thus far, were still well armed. It isn't as though they didn't have the artillery to use, rather they had simply failed to bring it up to the front. Abercrombie could have regrouped, given his men a few days to recover, brought the artillery up north with them, and then opened up an artillery barrage against the French. The British could have used those weapons to blast their way through the French defenses with little trouble. They could have simply dug in and blasted away at the French until Montcalm would have been forced to surrender. Essentially exactly the same way that had occurred the year before at Fort William Henry. However, the British did none of these things. The day was lost. The battle was lost. The question therefore becomes, what went wrong? In this situation, it seems pretty obvious that the failure was in not bringing the artillery forward, and depending on a frontal infantry assault. The British could have moved forward with artillery and just blasted their way through. There was nothing all that impressive about the French defense works, and really the only thing that they were ever going to do a good job of repelling was a direct infantry assault with small arms, which is exactly what Abercrombie gave them. Beyond that, Montcalm only really had the supplies to hold out for a little more than a week. Had Abercrombie laid siege, there was a limited amount of resisting the French could have meaningfully done. Yet again, though, the British did not do this. This, of course, leaves us with the question of why the British did not just try again. It seems that by the end of the battle, a general panic had run through the camp. The British troops, who were badly shaken after the day's events, feared that the French were going to launch an offensive against them. This is supported by all of the British gear and supplies that was left back near the landing site. It suggests, correctly, that Abercrombie and his men left in a hurry. Despite the panic amongst the men, there was never any kind of a pursuit by the French. The French had fully expected that another attack was coming and were instead busy spending their time preparing for it. The loss at Karelin is another devastating blow for the British. They had walked in with an overwhelming numerical advantage, and then they had just been soundly defeated, withdrawing despite still holding an overwhelming numerical advantage. <laughs> 
For Montcalm, the victory was stunning. Realizing that his star was on the rise, he used the opportunity to strike out against Vaudreuil, whom he blamed for Karelin being so lightly garrisoned. Montcalm, despite the victory, would launch no counterattack of his own. The harvest was upon him, meaning that his men were desperate to go home. Likewise, he still recognized that there was a large British army hanging out not that far to his south. Rather than pushing his luck, Montcalm worked on reinforcing the fortification at Karelin, preparing for another British attack, which he knew to be inevitable. 1758, therefore, began just as every year had since 1755. The British had yet again been dealt a devastating loss at the hands of the French. However, if this represented a low moment for the British, the fact remains that in 1758, we are still dealing with a vastly different war than we had in those prior years. William Pitt's policies were transformative for the overall war effort, even if Abercrombie's expedition had just been a colossal failure. Next time, we are going to join Jeffrey Amherst as he moves against Lewisburg. With the British desperately needing a win, it is going to be up to Amherst to deliver. With that, I hope you all have an excellent two weeks. I hope that you are staying healthy and staying safe. And I will see you back here next time to see if the Lewisburg part of the expedition goes any better for the British. <laughs>